Hello everybody, Kyle here from Web Dev Simplified. In today's video, we're going to be cleaning up some code by going through a code review on a project that's run by cats. Let's get started now. Let's first take a look at the project as a whole to figure out how we can make changes and to figure out how it works. First, we have a weather application here that's going to show you your current weather for whatever location you type in. Also down here, we just have some random HTML CSS, which we aren't going to worry about. Next, we have the products page, which is where we're going to spend most of our time. We have a hangman game here, a browser to-do list, and lastly, a song maker, where when you click on these buttons, it'll play certain sounds for you. And then lastly, we have an about section, which is just more HTML CSS, again, something that we're not going to worry about looking at. So let's dive into the code to figure out how this all works. The first thing to note is that this application is using Node.js and Express to run its server, it has a templates folder, which contains all of the different views, which are written using handlebar notation. And we lastly have a public folder here, which for the most part is going to contain the JS, which is what we're worried about for this code review. Also, we have a couple utility functions inside of this utils folder that are used inside of our server folder. The first place that I want to look at for our code review is on the home page and with our weather service. So if we expand here our browser a little bit, Scroll down to the section that's using the weather. As we can see, we have an app.get weather section. And this is going to be the code that gets called when we click on this show me the weather button. And inside of here, there's already quite a few things that we can change. First of all, as you can see, this is using callbacks and nesting multiple callbacks inside of each other, which is always a red flag for something that could be changed because it could lead to callback hell. Also, we're duplicating our error returns here. As you can see, we're checking for an error, and both times we're doing the exact same thing with that error, which again is something that promises and async await can help you avoid. Before we dive too much further into this actual layout in the server, let's look at these two functions, geocode and forecast. These are defined inside of these utilities, so we'll just open both of these up. And let's first look at the geocode. And essentially all this does is take a few parameters and then it's going to use this request library, which works a lot like fetch. It's essentially allowing us to call an API. And again, it's returning these callbacks. But one thing that immediately jumps out to me in this function is that this callback returns either first an error message as the first parameter or actual results as the second parameter. So you always have to pass undefined for one of these two options when you call the callback. I don't really like this because it automatically makes one callback do two different things. It both handles errors and it handles data. And I'd really like to separate this into two different things, which is where promises are really going to be key. We have the exact same problem in this forecast function, because again, we're doing the exact same thing where we have one callback that handles both the data and the actual error handling. So I'm gonna to jump to an example of where I've changed this code and show you what I would do to use promises and async await to clean this up. So here's the reworked version of our app.js. As you can see, we're using async await in order to avoid callback hell. We're using this line here to first call our geocode function, and then directly after that, we're calling our forecast function, and then sending the result back down to the client. And as you can see, we're catching our error in one location, which means we don't have to duplicate our error code across our different callbacks, and we have it all in one place. Also, if we go inside of our geocode or forecast function, you see, instead, we're using promises to return our results, which means that we have separate callbacks for rejecting for when we have an error and resolving for when we have successful data, which means we don't have to return undefined for our error or for our data, depending on the result of our actual operation. It also means in our app.js, we don't have to handle these two different situations when we are using the callback. We just use the await, and instead of here, we're going to get the result, or if it fails, it'll go down and catch the error. We did the exact same thing here with our forecast, where again, we split this out, we used a promise, and reject and resolve in order to avoid having to pass undefined through and potentially entering callback hell. This overall was a pretty straightforward change and something that you'll see a lot in older applications before promises were created or async await was created, you'll see this callback problem and it's a really easy fix to throw in these promises and change your callbacks to either resolve or reject and then inside of your actual code consuming it, just changing that to be flattened instead of having all of the different callbacks and using the await keyword here. Jumping back into the old code, I want to move on to the products section, and the very first thing we can look at is the hangman game. Let's open that up inside of our JavaScript, hangman.js, and take a look at what we have here. First thing I notice is that we have this class called game, and already that's a red flag for me because game is an incredibly generic name. This should be something like hangman game or hangman or something else to denote this as a particular game 
instead of just a game in general. Other than that, I like that classes are being used here because they make organizing data inside of an object much easier than using just a bunch of functions. Another red flag that immediately jumps out to me is this dot status. This status is set to a string here, and it's being checked against a bunch of different strings all over the place. And these are all strings that are exactly the same. It either is going to be plain, failed, or finished. It always is one of those three things. And as you can see in the code, there's a bunch of places this status is being checked. And it's really easy to accidentally misspell one of these strings. For example, you forget the I in plain, and it's really easy to miss that, and you won't get any errors when you run your code. So this is a really great example where an enumeration would be perfect for fixing this code. The last thing to note about this hangman example is down here a ways, we have these getters right here, puzzle element and guess element, and it's very misleading the name of these different variables because this puzzle element and guess element don't really correspond to what you'd think they would. Also, you're using the remaining time variable identifier and the your guess identifier to get these things and they don't really line up. This ID doesn't really line up with this variable name and same with this variable name and this ID. So what I did in my example is I changed these names to be much more in line with what they're actually representing. Another thing to note is that document.query selector is used here, even though we're just querying on an ID. So it'd be best to use get element by ID instead. So we could change this to get element by ID and remove that hashtag. And that would work just as well and be slightly faster for your code. So let's look at the example of all the different changes. Here's the updated version of the hangman game. And the first thing you'll notice is I changed this class name to be hangman game because it's much easier to reason what that class is. Also, I pulled out these different status variables into an enum. And since JavaScript doesn't have enums built into it, the easiest way to create an enum is to create some form of constant variable, which is an object. And that object's keys are going to be the value of the enum here. So plain, finished, and failed. And then the value of those keys are just going to be whatever your enum is encoded as. This way you can never misspell the word plain here because if we go down, you can see if I'd start typing here failed, it'll automatically be populated in just like this. And if I put something else here, I'm going to get an error in the browser if I try to run this and it's spelled incorrectly. So by having this enum, it forces me to always have a property which is defined on an object up here. And this is the best way to deal with these type of enum strings or any form of string comparison where it's a set in stone string. You want to use these constant variables up here to do that. And lastly, as I mentioned before, I renamed these variables down here so that they're much easier to reason with what they are actually representing inside of the code. Again, these are really straightforward changes. The code overall is really well written. The biggest change is this enum section, which I think makes the code much easier to reason with what's going on, and it makes it much more error proof in the future. And this is a great thing to put into your tool belt. Next, back in our old application, we have the browser based to do list. So the way this works is you can type in anything here and click add new item. It'll add a to do. You can remove the to do, add a bunch of different to do's if you want, and you can mark them as complete or unmark them so that they're not complete. And also you can do some filtering up here. So I can do a search, for example, let's put in one, all these. And if I search, you'll see it'll automatically filter that list for me. So now let's look at the code for how this works. Let's go in here to do.js. And this code is, I think, the most complex of all of the code in the application, and it's kind of the messiest. And I think one of the reasons for that is that there's no classes being used, and everything is just a bunch of different functions and global variables in order to determine what's going on. So as you can see, we have a bunch of different loading and saving functions, getting, creating, and it becomes really complex. And certain functions like get to do's are almost entirely useless because all they're doing is returning a variable which is already defined up here. So this get to do's really does absolutely nothing for us. And there's quite a few variables that are like that in this application. For example, there's one called get filters just right here. And it's again, returning just a variable filters. So let's look at how I would rework this using a class in order to change some of these problems. One of the main things is this filters method and this filters object. I don't really like that this is storing a object key value pair for all the different filters, I think this should be defined inside of a class and the setting of the filters should be their individual own methods instead of setting the filters based on just an object. So let's look at the new code right now. So immediately, the first thing that'll jump out with you with this new code is that we're using a class for the to-do list and we have very few actual global objects. All of this is inside of the class and down here, the only thing that's global is our actual class that we create here, our to-do list. 
and all the different elements that we need in order to hook this up, such as these add buttons, remove buttons, search boxes, and so on. Also, all of our different document event listeners are down here, but that's perfectly fine because we need those to be global. Let's go back up to the top and look at our class itself, and you can see that we pass in everything we need inside of the class. We pass in this list, which is just going to be where we put all of our elements. We pass in our message element and our summary element. We essentially pass in all of these different elements here that we need to use in order to lay out our to-dos and create our to-dos. Then we load our to-dos as soon as we create this object, and this load function just gets them from local storage and saves them into this class right here so that we can use these objects and persist them when we refresh the page. Next, we have a bunch of different helper functions for getting the to-dos, storing the to-dos, etc. And these functions are very similar to the old applications functions, but instead of being randomly thrown throughout the application, they're all inside of one nice coherent object which will allow us to make this really easy to know what this does. This to-do list just handles a list of to-dos, and all the functions to do so are built into the class itself instead of being throughout the entire object and the entire file. And as you can see with the filters, I broke them out as attributes on the actual object so that they can be set and got individually instead of having to call a set function, which will try to set all of them at once or none of them at all. So this just makes it really easy to set these different filters without having to do a bunch of complex object manipulation. Other than that though, the code for this stayed very similarly. The main thing that changed was just throwing it in the class like I mentioned. Now let's jump back and look at our very last project. Here we go, we have the old code open, and if we scroll down, the last project we have is this music maker, and this one's really straightforward. Let's open this up, it's this meow class right here, and as you can see, this class is very straightforward. We have a list of variables here with all of our different colors, and then when we click on a key, all we do is we just create that ball that flies across the screen and play the sound, etc. And there's really only one thing about this that I don't like, and that is that this colors variable is storing the different color values from our CSS. So we have CSS variables called blue, yellow, red, light yellow, and light blue, which correspond to the different colors of our buttons in our browser. But this color list order is entirely dependent on the order of the browser buttons. If we swap the order of these buttons in the browser, this will no longer work properly and it won't actually send a colored ball of the right color. So instead of determining what the color of the ball is based on these variables, I wanna get the color from the actual element that the user clicks on. So let's look at how I did that in the reworked version of this code. Here I have the new version of the code open and as you can see immediately, that color list is completely gone. And instead, here we're getting the color by going and getting the computed style of the actual key that we click on, and we're just getting the background color of that element. This means that we no longer need to know the name of the CSS variable inside of our JavaScript, and we no longer need to worry about the order of our array being exactly the same as the order of the elements on our page, because that's something that's very easy to change in the future. If we added in, for example, here an orange button right next to this red button, we would now need to change our JavaScript our CSS, and our HTML, and it's really easy to forget about the JavaScript when we're changing these things because you don't think of that as connected to the HTML and CSS. Other than that small change though, this JavaScript code is really solid and straightforward and there's nothing else about it that I would change. And that's all I would change about this project. Overall, I thought the project was incredibly well done and the changes I made were very minor overall. If you want me to review your projects, make sure to leave a link down below in the comments or send it over to me on my Twitter so I can take a look. Also, if you enjoyed this code review video, check out my other code review videos, which are going to be linked over here. Thank you all very much for watching this video, and have a good day.